So we're starting to see a few issues with the problem of outer space treaty. So let's talk through it first. I mean, this is one that we kind of already started with, and that is... It's kind of like, here are three yeah. big gray areas. So yeah. These were all deliberately written into the treaty yes. to get it signed originally. If it, if it had been clear on these points, probably no one would have signed it. Yeah. So it's not accidental that the law That's right, that's right, exactly. It, yeah, it wasn't so the first one is there's no definition of space. Yep. second one is it's not clear who is responsible but, for a spacecraft. It's also unclear about private property in space. And, and, I, and I think this one in particular, when it was, it was written, this wasn't really a thing back then, right? Oh, so It was either the USA or the USSR. That was it. Yeah, but let's think about space first. Yep. Now, we've seen that if you're air laws, you own it. Yep. The air above Australia is Australian. No That's one else right. can fly without our permission. Ah. Um, but how far up does that go? Yeah, and, and this is the problem, right? Space is property of everybody. Yes. Air is not, but no one wrote down and space is where, where cut off. Yes. Height. So in practice, air is where you can fly supported by wings. Yes. So you have enough lift from the atmosphere. Yeah. We've seen the atmosphere doesn't suddenly go away. At some yes. Height. It gradually decreases. And so it gets harder and harder to fly using wings. So there's just a physical engineering limit that we yes. have here. So the highest aircraft may be 30 or 40 yeah, kilometers yeah. up, and that's still really hard. Yeah. Some balloons can go a bit higher than that. But it, that's, e I mean, that's pushing it, yeah. And then space, basically space is where air is thin enough that you can stay in orbit. That's right. So Earth, air law, space, space law. But where do you draw the boundary? Yeah. So in practice, it's not a real problem because you can't get aircraft much more than 30 or 40 yep. kilometers up. Most aircraft are 10 kilometers up for cruising. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And spacecraft don't normally get much lower than a couple of hundred kilometers. Because by that time, they're actually going to start burning up in the Earth's atmosphere. So there's probably a boundary somewhere between you know, 30 or 40 kilometers and 200 kilometers. So it's kind of left vague, not just because they didn't want to deal with it, or they couldn't figure out really... the physics. It doesn't matter. That's right. Uh, it doesn't really matter too much. I mean, the only th craft that goes through that are usually on the way up or the yes, way down. Yes, exactly. Um, where it matters is for <laughs> bragging rights for billionaires. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. So you've got uh, the two rival companies doing space tourism, um, and they get to different heights. Yeah, so they get to about 80... 80 to, kilometers, and this yeah. got to just over 100 kilometers. That's right. Deliberately, I think it was 100.01 or something. Yeah, exactly. Like. Yeah, yeah. So basically the question is, most people think that the people are going to put a boundary of space somewhere between 50 miles, which is yep. 80 kilometers, or 100 kilometers. Yeah. People talk about the Kármán line or the von Kármán line, yep. but that's, that's defined as where planes can't fly anymore. So it's very vague because it depends exactly. on the design of your plane. And as we talked about before, it depends on the atmosphere, which changes regularly. So, yeah. So it's not been very well defined. Some people say 80 kilometers, some people say 100. It's probably going to be somewhere around mm -hmm. then. The distinction is mostly important to the billionaires because this aircraft made it to 80 kilometers but didn't make it to 100 kilometers. That's right. So if you pick 100 kilometers as your definition, these people don't get out. And the US use that you often use a number of 50 miles because they use miles, not 82 yeah. kilometers. It's not defined, yeah. and it probably doesn't particularly matter at the moment unless you're looking for bragging rights. Okay. So of all the vaguenesses in the space law, this is probably not a big problem okay. at this all point. Right. Because by the time you're in space, you're in space and it's clearly yeah. defined. But the next problem is who has responsibility yeah. for a spacecraft. Now, the laws say it's the country that launches it and designs it. And for a long time, that was the same. Yeah, yeah that's right. The USA would design a spacecraft and launch it from a US That's right. launch pad. Yep. But the what US happens if that... an Australian company, uh, which is um, maybe owned by a shell company in the Cayman Islands mm -hmm. and is headquartered in Singapore, um, decides to contract an American company to build a rocket that's then launched an Indian rocket yep. to supply telecommunications into China. Yeah. And that sort of thing is happening all oh, yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah, these complicated scenarios are all the time. That's right. And the rules are really not very clear about who is responsible. Yeah, because is it, is it the company that actually owns it? Is it the country that launches it? Is it the rocket builder? Yeah, it becomes... that. And as you pointed out earlier, right, even if the country launches it against the will or the company launches it against the will of the country, that country is still on the line. But which country is it? The country exactly. that launched it? Yes. The country that built it? Um, so for most commercial enterprises, if you were having a brand space, you wanted yeah. to launch your own communication stuff, like you'd sign a big treaty with everyone involved to make this all clear. That's right. Um, but the similar situation occurs in the sea. Yeah. And what's happened in the sea is that most ships are registered to flags of convenience countries that don't charge them a tax, don't have any rules. Okay. So most of the ships in the ocean are owned by Liberia or Panama or something yeah. like this. This That's is a right. Liberian registered ship. It's actually owned by a Japanese company and it's flying an American flag. Yeah. Um, but it's actually, so actually, I think it's probably a Liberian no, flag, a Liberian similar flag. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
so what happens if let's say you want to launch a rocket and you think that American uh, space law uh, you can launch it from the US but you think American space law is a bit too onerous that's right maybe you can uh, register a company in Tonga that's right and launch it from um, use it claim to be a Tongan launch thing and they probably don't have any space law so you can do anything you damn well like or maybe you can pay French Guiana to set up your spaceport and launch your rockets because it's a little bit easier which is what Europe does so uh, unclear yeah um, we're already seeing flags of convenience in yes. space. Tonga, in particular, has been leasing out a right. uh, spacecraft uh, licenses for geostationary orbit to other countries. Yep. So very unclear what's actually going on here. The third problem is private property. Yep. Our, our space treaty says space is the pr property of all mankind. Now, the language here is obviously of the time, so they do mean humankind. Yes. But still, but what is the property of all humankind? Even me. Does that mean you launch a rocket? Every every one of the yeah, eight billion people on Earth gets a one eight billion share. Yeah, exactly. Uh, use of space to be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries. I mean, what does that well, mean? Well, and this is interesting, right? Because everyone has different interests and benefits. And you know, the previous part of the treaty was talking about different technologically and scientific advancement. That's it, regardless. But yeah, it becomes convoluted. Yes, I mean, let's say someone yeah. builds a space station for billionaire American tourists to inhabit. Uh, most that... people in the world won't benefit from this, that's right. Well, you claim they would because the money develops space technology. I mean, you can make some sort of claim. I'm sure you can. Um, or what happens if two companies want to mine the same asteroid or... Well, and this is right, you know, or even if they just want to grab the same stuff on the moon, what happens if okay, I can't claim ownership of the moon, but if I've extracted that soil, do I now get to claim it? Or does it have to be shared profit equally? Yeah, and so it's a real problem because yeah. um, I think some people were originally envisaging that space would be this communist utopia yeah. where everything was maybe done by some United Nations agency and the proceeds spread equally between every country on Earth. Which is but, very much not the case. But the United Nations doesn't have any rocket scientists. Um, you, are you really going to tell SpaceX that they must equally share their profit with every country on Earth? Yeah, that's not going to happen. But uh, and of course, most of the technology and development is being done by private companies yes. at the moment. And so... They, they're not going to work if they can't get any profits from it. That's right. So it's all grey. Yeah, I, I think it, it's, it's a very grey area in how we define it. And that this is a, a real issue moving forward.